Chapel campus. Um, I have the pri privilege um, and pleasure of being the co-director with my colleague, Dr. Kristen Favari of the Ethics Consult Service here at the U. And I serve on the Ethics Consult Service at Children's as well. And this is the last of um, the ethics grand rounds from the University of Colorado Hospital and the Center for Bioethics and Humanities of this season. We'll be joining you again in September. Um, and we are very pleased to have Dr. Anuj Mehta with us. Um, Dr. Mehta is an assistant professor in pulmonary and critical care at Denver Health um, and a Hospital Authority and the University of Colorado School of Medicine and National Jewish Health. Um, during the pandemic, he led the governor's expert emergency response um, committee's medical advisory group on the crisis stands of, of care and COVID-19 vaccine um, um, priority prioritization. Um, he was the lead author um, for the Colorado's um, crisis standards of care for a hospital and ventilator triage and the vaccination priority plan. So Anuj, earlier in the pandemic, he spoke to us about um, ethical issues and vaccine um, prioritization. And I'm assuming, Anuj, this is, um, you're going to tell us there's no more ethical issues. You have solved them all for the pandemic. I, I wish. Um, I apologize to everybody. I'm running a couple of minutes behind. I'm actually on service in the intensive care unit. Um, so uh, obviously I get a phone call at 1158 when you have to give a 12 o'clock talk. Um, so I'm just sharing my screen right now. Um, Jackie, if you can see it, do you mind giving me a thumbs up? All right. Um, well, thank you to everybody for um, for attending today. And thank you for inviting me to talk again about some of the ethical issues. Um, as as uh, Jackie said, my name is Anuj Mehta. I am a pulmonary and critical care attending um, at Denver Health and Hospital Authority and have been involved in multiple um, of the state endeavors related to COVID, specifically crisis standards of care and planning for the vaccines. Um, and I have a keen interest in the ethics surrounding some of the things that have been happening, obviously, as we talked about crisis standards of care. Um, but I am not an ethics expert. So really today is just gonna be posing some ongoing questions and hopefully people on the call may have some answers. Um, so the talk is, and I apologize if I get pulled away um, due to an emergency in the intensive care unit. Um, my talk today is entitled Continuing Ethical Challenges in the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, I have no financial or intellectual conflicts of interest. I, you know, as stated, served as the chair for a few of the state's um, endeavors related to uh, the pandemic. I don't receive any payments for my vaccine efforts or my crisis standards of care efforts. Um, and I will be discussing off-label uses of the COVID-19 vaccine because they have not yet been approved. Um, the objectives, objectives for today are fairly broad. Um, so we wanna identify some continuing ethical challenges with the COVID pandemic. We wanna describe how those are similar and some of how they're different than previous issues. We wanna try and come up with an ethical framework for addressing them and identify resources available to help address them. Um, I will say though that the best way I can imagine to talk about this is going through some key examples of where I think they're ongoing ethical issues. So we're gonna address each of those objectives through the talking about COVID-19 vaccination, um, talk about crisis standards of care and the global pandemic. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about the lasting impact of the pandemic and thinking forward to the next pandemic. Um, and I really wanna highlight that. I, I don't have any answers. Um, I think that, um, the last 14 months has humbled, 15, 16 months has humbled me in ways that I could have never um, thought possible, um, both from a clinical perspective, from an academic perspective and personal perspective, but also on an ethical level about how little I know. And when I think I have some answers, I, I, I hear different perspectives and, and I have to rethink that. Um, so to start off, I wanted to chat about what I think is at least in the media, the biggest ethical challenge that we face right now with COVID-19 vaccination and the inequities and hesitancy that we're experiencing. Um, and so this is as of this weekend, some um, data from both Colorado and from um, the CDC. Uh, in Colorado, we have about 5.7 million people. That's about our population. And 
um, as of this weekend, we had slightly over 3 million people that had received one dose, which is pretty good. Um, and um, almost half of our population had been fully immunized, um, 2.5 million. And let's remember that, you know, um, those 12 to 18 have just come online and people younger than 12 are not yet eligible for the vaccine. And if you look to um, national data, we're seeing similar levels of um, over 3 hundred million doses of vaccine being administered um, and that we've been able to um, vaccinate with, uh, more than 50 percent of the population with at least one dose. And we know there's a lot of variability in terms of states. Um, some states have hit, um, reached 60 percent already and other states are lagging far behind. Um, so, uh, you know, this is data from um, CDPHE's website. Um, and I think the ethical challenges really come up when you start delving into the vaccine questions a little bit more. So it, the question really becomes who is getting vaccinated or more importantly, who is not getting vaccinated? And what this chart looks at is race and ethnicity and gender based on vaccine status. So the gray boxes are kind of, are the um, population level um, uh, of uh, Colorado. So, um, what you'll see here is uh, for say Hispanic, the population um, consists of about 20 to 20 to 22% people who self-identify as Hispanic or Latinx um, and about uh, four to 5% self-identify as black or African-American. And what we can see is the colored bars represent the percentage of that population that's been vaccinated. And we're really falling behind um, um, in both people who self-identify as black and self-identify as Hispanic. And this is replicated in other states. This is a pattern we're seeing a lot um, that we're not matching the percentage of people who have been vaccinated with the people that make up the general population. And we also see some, um, some uh, slight differences based on gender as well. So we then have to, I think, ask ourselves is, you know, vaccinations are our truest pathway of exiting the pandemic, I think. And so if we're not doing it in an equitable fashion, what are some of the challenges and what ethical questions does that do they raise? Um, and so this is um, rough data from a survey that is not yet public from CDPHE that investigated vaccine hesitancy. And what they based on the respondents, they kind of divided people up into um, the people that have already gotten it, that are in blue, and then in green, yellow, and um, red are the people that are not yet vaccinated. And amongst the people that are not yet vaccinated, about 45% of them said they were a hard no on vaccination. About 30% were wait and see or unsure, and about a quarter were on it as soon as possible. Um, and then again, these are the percentages of those that are not yet vaccinated. And in Colorado, as I stated, we're close to 40 to 50% of people that are already vaccinated. Um, and so what I find really fascinating is as we delve into the data about who's not yet vaccinated, um, we really see some really philosophical and practical differences. You know, I think when we talk about hesitancy, sometimes we group everybody together. Um, and, and what this survey in my mind really highlighted is that there's different barriers and different facilitators um, that will help us vaccinate more people that want to be vaccinated and understanding the differences in demographics, I think is important. So the people that are wait and see, which is this yellow group or really unsure about whether they wanna be vaccinated, they're not hard nosed. They actually tended to be more likely to be Hispanic. They were not college educated. They are a mix of urban and rural areas. Um, they, you know, it's always important where people get their information or who they trust. Um, and they trust information from friends and family, but they also place a decent amount of trust in physicians in the scientific community. Um, and there are a lot of concerns about side effects in this group that are wait and see. Um, and at the same time, there are some lingering access issues that were highlighted as a, as a reason for maybe not getting vaccinated. The hard no group, which if you just look at people who are not vaccinated and you lump them together, you might not recognize that there are significant differences in these groups, but the hard no group was actually very different. They're far more likely to be white, rural, and conservative. They also were less likely to be college educated. They're less likely to trust um, physicians and scientists and government. Um, and this was actually a question about who you trust. They were more likely to trust Donald Trump for information about the pandemic and more likely to rely on social media. There were concerns, fewer concerns about side effects and more concerns about overall efficacy, or more importantly, why we needed vaccines in general. Um, and they were less likely to have access issues. 
And so what this really raises is that I think the, um, you know, the charge, what this highlighted to me is that we really need to be talking to people um, in different ways and identifying what may be driving their hesitancy um, because I think it's a, both an ethical and moral imperative that we try and overcome some of the ethic, um, the ethnic racial gaps that we're seeing in vaccination. Um, and so, you know, from an access perspective, this is actually a provider map um, for Colorado. That you can ignore the colors of the flags. You do see that in Southeast Colorado, there's a little bit more um, distance somebody would have to drive to get the vaccine, but it, it tends to actually map the map, match the population density. But um, some of the access issues that were raised by the people that were wait and see or unsure were less likely to be related to location. And part of it has to do with the fact that there's actually pretty high density in a lot of areas in Colorado. They were more likely to be concerned about side effects um, and the issues related to Johnson & Johnson really kind of caused some people to spiral about um, side effects. Um, and that actually raised its own ethical question about whether the pause had more of a negative impact or a positive impact in reassuring people that the system is working in identifying rare side effects or raised more issues that people are less likely to trust the vaccine. And as many people have probably heard, um, we're facing an issue with um, expiration of Johnson & Johnson doses because of drop off in demand. Um, Time off was actually something that came out um, at, from the survey. And this leads into a fairly large political debate, but there were a lot of people that had been out of work for significant periods of time during the pandemic and are now returning to work. They're in the food service industry. They work at Walmart or, or something along those lines. And they recently now have a paycheck again. And they are concerned, not just with time off to get the vaccine, which from what I've heard is most vaccine clinics are actually fairly efficient. It's more of an issue of what to do when you have side effects. So we know that the rates of fevers, chills, uh, malaise, things that would prevent you from going to work for a day or two uh, um, happen with the vaccines and more likely after the second dose of Pfizer and Moderna. And a lot of people in our state and across the country don't have paid time off. And so if you just got a job back and then you have to take, um, say you call out sick, you know that may actually um, um, dissuade people from getting the vaccine. This goes into a big conversation about um, paid time off and how that affects healthcare. And I think that's a core ethical issue that affects not only the pandemic, but a lot of other aspects of healthcare in general. There's ongoing concerns about immigration insurance and ability to pay. Um, and you know, for everybody um, to know, and they can pass this on to anybody they know, um, um, every vaccine site is, is a no-go for ICE. Um, you don't need to have legal status to, um, to receive the vaccine. You don't have to have insurance. You don't have to have any ability to pay for it. People are allowed to ask for insurance information such that um, they can bill the insurance for a vaccine administration fee. But actually, the Biden administration is coming out with warnings to all vaccine providers and insurance companies indicating that um, any attempt to bill patients for COVID-19 vaccination will be met with um, significant penalties. Not, I don't know what those are, but that's kind of what the language that they're using are. Um, and all of these access issues, were, access issues were greater for people who are uninsured. And some of these actually have solutions. Um, and so, you know, greater education about immigration insurance and things like that. The fact that you don't have to have legal status or insurance um, could potentially um, help people make the right decision for themselves. I've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks um, in, or last few months in the vaccine hesitancy space. And there are no right answers in terms of how to talk to people who might be, but there are some strategies that might work. And I think educating all providers is actually an ethical imperative and a moral imperative um, because we need to make sure we're reaching the people that are the most scared about the vaccine to give them the right information to, to, to make a decision for themselves. And so I think it's important to recognize the difference between philosophical and logistical um, hesitancy. So philosophical, and that's more the hard no people that just may not believe in vaccines and no amount of um, discussion is actually gonna um, persuade them. Versus the logistical issues, that's just you know trying to fix a problem. Um, we have to listen, acknowledge and validate people. So, you know, uh, Probably, you know, when I first heard the, the concept of an mRNA vaccine as being the potentially first uh, vaccine for COVID, I was like, that seems crazy that we're going to take this new technology. And so it's not 
being hesitant and having questions about the vaccine is completely appropriate. And despite the fact that many of us are in healthcare and we've been talking about vaccines for a while, for many people, these are some of the first conversations that they've had. And so listening, acknowledging that it's okay to have questions and validating it and letting people make their own decisions is an ongoing ethical and moral imperative. Meeting people where they are. So um, that's something that CDPHE and a lot of different groups are trying to do. This means going into the community. This means working with community leaders, targeting small groups, partnering with trusted community leaders. Um, and, you know, if we just rely on large hospitals sending out emails, we're going to disenfranchise a lot of um, a lot of people. And that's just not a practical issue that then raises the question, are we ethically offering um, appropriate amounts of uh, information to all populations? Um, uh, sorry, hold on one second. There's an ICU issue. I apologize. Um, and so we need to work with smaller groups. Um, um, we need to improve access. So I think we have adequate numbers of locations. But, and, you know, people that work nights, um, they have issues uh, potentially struggling to make appointment times. Um, people that have shifts that ch change or concerns about, um, you know, paid time off. I think those are all areas that we need to advocate for as healthcare providers. Expanding hours to night dosing, increasing the number of mobile bands. We've relied heavily on mass vaccination clinics and also, um, you know, hospital cl vaccination clinics, but relying more on PCPs and pediatricians, working with schools and camps as we bring more um, adolescents and children online, I think um, potentially will um, help us ensure that we're not perpetuating some of the inequities that we've seen during the pandemic. And then, you know, there's always this question about incentives and mandates. Um, and, you know, Colorado uh, is running a $5 million lottery right now for vaccination, which is interesting. And Ohio saw a pretty large bump when they started doing that in vaccination rates. And whether that's more effective than other strategies remains to be seen. Um, but that actually leads me in, and, and as, as I said, I have no answers here, but these are all suggestions and, and areas that I think are um, uh, er, uh, fruitful discussion points. But this actually leads into the next issue of mandates and passports, which I think is a huge ethical, legal, and moral question. Um, so uh, um, Govind Prasad is a professor of law at the University of Denver. I've had the pleasure of working with him on mul in multiple areas. And he and others have written multiple opinion pieces about the legal validity of COVID-19 um, uh, mandates. And I think in the legal community, if you talk to legal scholars, not to politicians, but legal scholars, there's a lot of room. Um, uh, a lot of people believe that mandates for COVID-19 vaccines are legal, um, even when under emergency use. Now, both Pfizer and Moderna are applying for full approval. And so I think the debate about a mandate for an emergency use authorization only vaccine is going to die away in the next couple of weeks once they receive full authorization. So here I'm talking about, let's ignore this emergency use issue. Let's talk about fully approved um, uh, vaccines, which you know will hit over the summer. Um, and on the flip side of that um, is uh, House Bill um, uh, 1191, which came up for discussion in committee um, during this previous legislative session. I think it was debated in committee on May 12th, and it was to prohibit discrimination on COVID-19 vaccine status. These are the sponsors, both of whom are Republican state um, legislatures. I'm not going to make any sort of political comment here, but what I want to highlight is this bill actually was the exact opposite. It was attempting to ban COVID-19 vaccine mandates on all levels, whether it's from um, uh, educational institutions, um, healthcare institutions, actually, um, state government or different um, or individual employers were not would not be allowed to mandate um, COVID-19 vaccines. Um, uh, this bill um, was uh, replicated in about 40 state legislatures um, uh, and was heavily influenced by some anti-vaccine groups. Um, and um, in, the, in the heart of it had some disinformation. There were some factually incorrect uh, statements. I had the pleasure of testifying against this bill because I thought that certain tenants of it actually would break down our public health um, infrastructure since really in very general and broad strokes, it talked about um, um, eliminating any type of mandated health, um, which, uh, you know, as we'll talk about is, are some of the cornerstones of public, some public health work that we do. So, but this was the flip side uh, of the discussion on mandates. Um, and um, it did get voted down in committee, so never advanced to the full house, um, may be raised in the future. 
Um, so where are we seeing mandates that already exist? So in higher education, higher education has already adopted mandates in droves, namely for the fall semester or even the summer um, uh, term. Um, people need to provide proof of vaccination status to, to be on campus. And so the University of Colorado, University of Denver, Fort Lewis, Colorado College, and several others have signed on in Colorado. Other universities, Columbia, Georgetown, I think Harvard as well, have also adopted vaccine mandates. Um, healthcare institutions, not in Colorado yet that I know of, but I, I, I think that there are some groups that are working on it. Um, if, uh, there was actually a hospital in Houston that was mandating the vaccine, um, and there was a walkout over the mandate by employees, um, I think yesterday or the day before. So we're seeing a big split in opinion on mandates. Um, and I think some of the ethical issues really are the core of public health here, um, that this is an age old debate. It's putting the individual versus society liberty to accept or refuse things um, versus safety, um, you know, utilitarianism arguments, the greatest good for the greatest many. And I am a science nerd, sci-fi nerd. So, um, you know, quoting Spock in Star Trek II, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Um, and what that translates to in terms of healthcare um, is uh, patient autonomy, right? In the ICU here, I have have um, patients that want to refuse care, and I let them. In fact, I had a patient that um, who could have imp improved from COVID, um, was on 100% um, oxygen, and wanted to leave. And so we established home hospice, and we sent him home, um, likely to die. Uh, and that was his right to choose that because he had capacity. So freedom to refuse medications and refuse treatments are, is the cornerstone of health care. Um, freedom to establish safety in one's own businesses. Um, you know, there's actually requirements of employers based on um, the ADA, the American Disability Act, and other um, other pieces of law that require employers to establish safe work environments. And so, you there's actually some viewpoints that by not having COVID vaccine mandates. Um, People with um, that are unable to get the um, vaccine either through because they're allergic, they have, um, or some other immunodeficiency would be unsafe in a work environment. So they need to create safe environments. Um, and then there's also the flip side of, you know, I want to be able to go to a grocery store and be free from being infected. You know, there's no right answer, but these are the arguments that um, really are entrenched in this idea of can you mandate something? You know, public health has enshrined a lot of. Um, several areas where we do force treatments on people. Um, so right, um, seatbelt laws, uh, um, the helmet laws, which are not necessarily adopted in, um, in uh, Colorado, but seatbelt laws are, and they are required to protect people's safety. Um, seatbelt laws are actually really interesting because it doesn't protect anybody else. It's the individual who's making decision not to wear a seatbelt by forcing them, it's gonna protect them. And that's as opposed to smoking bans. Um, right, we don't allow smoking in most indoor and outdoor locations. That is both to protect the health of the individual, but the health of those around them to be free of secondhand smoke. This, um, it's, it's interesting to me because I think um, mask mandates were very similar to smoking bans, and that analogy was never made in the press. Um, but, uh, you know, we all are used to the fact that you can't smoke in a bar anymore. I mean, I remember when um, in college you could, um, and you can't do that anymore. And there might be some grumblings, but not a lot anymore. TB isolation is probably the best example of an infectious disease related um, mandate. Um, you know, we can force isolate people. We force people to have directly observed TB therapy. For people without capacity, you know, we for can force them to have psychiatric care and there's a whole process for that. Um, those are different because those are people that are sick. So you're forcing them to receive treatment. Vaccines take a healthy person and you force them to receive something um, to prevent illness. But there are examples of that too. So in Colorado, we have the flu vaccine mandate for healthcare facilities and the mandates to healthcare facilities, not to um, individual um, per people, but healthcare facilities have to document 90% compliance um, either through mandate, uh, through vaccine or exemption. And then we have vaccine mandates for schools and universities. And what's key about almost all, all these mandates is also the fact that, right, they're exemptions. Um, their medical exemptions, their personal and religious exemptions, and really the language has evolved now to say medical and non-medical exemptions. Um, and in fact, um, two years ago, um, Colorado vastly restricted the type of exemptions that you can have for um, school um, vaccinations. Um, you still could cite a, a medical exemption and you can still have a non-medical exemption, but the process for getting a non-medical exemption was, was a little bit more rigorous and anti-vaccine groups heavily fought that. And that's partly because Colorado has 
um, for um, pretty low rates of childhood vaccinations and, and, and centered in a few areas. Um, but what I'm trying to highlight here is this is an ongoing ethical debate. I'm not trying to weigh in on what's right or what's wrong, but you can see the idea of pitting um, the individual rights to, to refuse treatment versus um, the individual right, the societal rights um, to protect the public health and individual rights to be able to be free from infection if they are unable to be vaccinated. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, global vaccination efforts, um, because I think that's really another area where kind of the ethics are um, robust, the ethical discussions, and probably where we're deviating a little bit more than we should. So um, I, I do research. I'm a researcher in addition to being a provider. Um, and so this is the International Ethical Guidelines for Biomedical Research. Um, this came out in 2002. It's had some revisions. Um, and anybody that does research, if you're involved, if you're doing international research, there's a whole host of criteria and, and um, that you need to uh, meet to be able to do that research internationally, right? We always have to protect our human subjects, but when you go international, it involves extra protection. So guideline 10 specifically deals with research and populations and communities with limited resources. And what I would like to highlight here is that the research is responsive to the health needs and the priorities of the population and community in which is to be carried out. Namely, you can't test a drug in a community that doesn't have the disease that their drug treats. That would be crazy because there's no benefit. But then I, the second point I think is kind of where the ethical dilemma about what we're doing on a global level really hits home is that any intervention or product developed or knowledge generated will be made reasonably available for the benefit of that population or community. We know that COVID does not know boundaries, does not follow a map, does not follow political or geopolitical boundaries. It affects every country, different rates based on different restrictions. And we also know that COVID vaccine testing required and necessitated international sites. So they were tested in multiple areas. Johnson & Johnson, actually 40% of the doses administered were in Latin America. And we know that the vaccines are not available in an equitable fashion. In large parts of Africa, um, you know, less than 1% of the population has been um, uh, vaccinated. Um, and in other areas, the estimate to time to actually vaccinate groups is, is you know, in the years um, versus months, which is what we're thinking in the United States. And so this raises a question is, have we violated the second tenet of a guide? It's a guideline, it's not a mandate. But have we violated this idea of like, if we're going to do international research, especially in areas with limited resources, are we then going to make those treatments available? And th these uh, ideas were really codified during the AIDS epidemic um, when a lot of um, uh, HIV-related therapy, anti antiviral therapy was tested in South Africa due to the high rates there. And people were required to make sure that the individuals that participate in the trial and the communities um, had ongoing access to those medications. And this is where I think maybe we're falling short, actually. In the Biden administration, um, as of yesterday, it's committed to buy 500 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine and distribute it around the world. world. It, Pfizer is not necessarily accessible in certain areas that don't have refrigeration. Now, we don't have to do the ultra low cold storage as much. You know, we're going to have a lot of Johnson & Johnson that expires and that's stable at room temperature for some degree of time. You know, what does that say if we don't try and redistribute that on a global level? You know, there are other areas that, um, that I think are at ethically challenged in terms of global vaccination efforts where we lose um, sight of um, what our global responsibilities are. And so several countries have embargoes against um, uh, raw materials. Um, so there have been embargoes against uh, polyethylene glycol um, uh, from export. The US had one for a short while and that, um, that's a key ingredient for some of the vaccines. We've seen people pulling out of shipment contracts. So COVAX, um, the Serum Institute of India had um, promised large percentages of the vaccines that they produce. It's the largest um, vaccine production facility in the country, in the world. Um, they were gonna contribute most of the doses to COVAX and they've pulled out of that. Um, but that's not, you know, um, you know, that's not just happening in India. We've seen um, uh, Italy prevented export of um, some of the va vaccine that were manufactured there to other countries. So we're seeing nations become more insular as they try and protect their own population, which makes a lot of sense. But as a result, we're seeing a very, as the CDC called it yesterday, two-track pandemic. Um, We've also seen vaccines as a political tool. Um, so uh, again, to get a little bit into politics, um, the, um, the administration has um, um, at least promised to provide some degree, some vaccine uh, number of vaccines to Taiwan, which China has um, 
not been shipping uh, vaccine to Taiwan as readily as other areas, and that's been con that's been viewed as a political tool to try and bring Taiwan more into the fold. Um, Venezuela, um, there has been virtually, I mean, they're far less than 1%. And the last estimate was that, it, that really with the current health infrastructure, it would take 10 years to vaccinate everybody in Venezuela. And it's, so we've also seen that, you know, the pandemic itself is a political tool, but this is also where vaccines are becoming a political tool to try and um, sway people. Um, you know, Russia, China, and um, United States all are trying to give vaccines now on a global scale. And how much of this that is, is to curry political favor? Um, all of which would, um, you know, kind of violate some of the ethical standards that I hope, I think most of us as healthcare workers um, hold dear. Um, um, and then there's also this question of which vaccine is best. Um, you know, I think this is a really tough question a lot of times, um, which vaccine is best, um, partially because, you know, they were, the they were tested differently. The efficacy in, um, um, in the Pfizer Moderna trials were equivalent, and, but Johnson & Johnson had lower efficacy. Granted, they were measuring against moderate to severe disease, not all disease, um, and that may have been a reason, but also they have equivalent efficacy against severe disease and death. So, um, you know, but there are a lot of people that feel if they're getting um, AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson, they're getting the second tier vaccine in, their, in um, developing world, developing nations. And, that, and that's, um, you know, I think leads to some ethical questions about are we equitably allocating all of our resources? I do want to talk about crisis standards of care um, and, and the global pandemic. So let me briefly mention, so crisis standards of care, for those of you that um, weren't part of the original talks, it's something that we developed in Colorado, we refined, and a lot of other states did the same. When we tried to view limited resources and how we would triage and allocate limited resources, there are other types of crisis standards of care. Um, essentially, that it's just whenever you deviate from your standard of care due to lack of resources. Specifically, what we developed was an algorithm to allocate ventilators and ICU beds. And we came close, um, but we never actually had to enact it in, a, in a, an official capacity here in Colorado. Um, and the WHO, the NIH, the Institute of Medicine, all of them have certain guidelines. There's been a lot of people that have written about how best to do this. There's no right way to do this. But what we saw in India um, over the last two months is a resurgence in thinking about this, um, especially through the lens of the global pandemic. Um, and so I have a lot of family in India. So this, this conversation is actually very close to my heart. Um, um, this is from an NPR article where COVID-19 was pushing junior doctors to their limits. And so there were articles and quotes from people that were no different than our, our residents, where they were the only person in the hospital at night, and they were deciding who gets a ventilator, who comes into the, um, who gets oxygen, uh, who comes into the hospital, who doesn't come into the hospital, in a way that we decided early on that the person providing care should never be the one to make those decisions due to the therapeutic relationship, the ethical and moral relationship that we as providers form with our patients. And, you know, what was happening there and what likely happened in Italy and Spain and other parts and may probably even parts of the U.S. early in the pandemic, you know, was that people were making decisions without um, um, without a core approach to it. And what we had thought about early on is that you need a transparent, open, fair, equitable and reproducible process by which to allocate scarce resources so that you're doing it in a fair and equitable way and not necessarily doing it kind of based on any sort of um, entrenched biases. Um, you know, this is, this is a picture of healthcare workers trying to do their best. And, and um, you know, it, it was, it's, it's, it's a tragic situation, black market oxygen, not being able to get oxygen. Um, I talked to some people who, um, you know, they were frankly being told not to get tested because you were, even if you were negative, you were high risk of getting COVID if you went to go get tested. Um, and so um, what we saw happening there, there's an ethical issue about how did we support on an international level um, countries with weak infrastructures, weak, weak health healthcare infrastructures um, with resources and planning. But then also this idea of, you know, we invested a lot of work and time in crisis standards of care in the United States. Um, I want to remind people of what Colorado's crisis standards of care involved. Um, this is not the best. This is not even close to the best, but this is what we approved. And so what we created was a triage score that combined on the first row, your, the chances of you surviving days to weeks given critical care. We use something called the SOFA score um, with the um, likelihood of surviving a year if given critical care resources using a modified Charleston comorbidity index. I don't want to debate the validity of this score. That's not the point of this, but to show you what it takes to calculate this, this is what you need to do the SOFA score. 
Um, and we already know that things like your renal function, the last row is biased by um, race and ethnicity. We know that, um, you know, if you're not in the United States, but if you're in a rural hospital in other places, you may not be able to check platelets or get an arterial blood gas or know what the bilirubin is. Um, and it was heavily influenced by, um, by plans to, um, um, by, by this idea of utilizing the electronic medical record, which is ubiquitous in the United States, to pull this data. So we wouldn't have to manually calculate it. Um, and that's combined with the um, tra modified Charleston comorbidity index, which you have to know whether somebody had chronic heart failure, dementia, chronic pulmonary disease, and we had specific definitions for each of these. Um, but you can see that this is a complex scoring system that people struggled with here with modern electronic medical records. I by no means am trying to say EMRs are actually a great thing. I'm pretty mixed on the opinion. Um, I prefer to type because no can, nobody could read my handwriting, but I also understand that EMRs lead to a lot of click fatigue and their problems. But in terms of generating a score, pulling things together from the background is actually an easy way to do it. But even here in the United States, we really struggled. So this is courtesy of um, Gene Abbott. Uh, so this, this is a government hospital pre-pandemic. Um, and this is their records room and every family had a bundle. And so you can imagine trying to calculate any of these scores if this is your medical record system, um, if the labs are on paper and you have to calculate everything by hand, it would be next to impossible to calculate these types of triage scores um, in an efficient manner to make real-time decisions, which is what's necessary during a pandemic. I actually had the opportunity um, through some uh, national ethics groups, the Health Ministry of India actually reached out to look for help in terms of how to develop triage protocols. Um, and we were able to provide our, um, our, the way we did it. And, and we offered the really big caveat that um, it's not that their system is bad. And, and, and I don't actually argue that many uh, providers would think that the EMR is the source of a lot of our burnout. Um, it's, it's different and um, it can do different things. And so these types of scores may not be as appropriate they also may not be as predictive. And so copying and pasting what we did in the United States to places like India, Nepal, other countries that are having surges is not appropriate. But the core ethical values may be reproducible. You wanna combine the likelihood of surviving acutely with the likelihood of surviving you know, um, you know, six months to a year and different comorbidities are gonna have different predictive factors there. Um, you also wanna take into account the social norms there and the likelihood of being able to do a lot of these things. And so, the other thing is this idea of moving beyond ventilators, right? Ventilators are a very advanced concept. I, um, during residency, had the pleasure of working for two months in a hospital in Tanzania. Um, and it was a very well-equipped hospital, but critically ill patients didn't get put on ventilators. Um, it was just the amount of resources to do that would was just too much and would detract from other people. So ventilators are actually, simple idea of ventilators is a resource that a lot of people in the country in different worlds don't have. But then you have to start thinking about triaging other things. How do you decide who gets a hospital bed? Who is allowed into the hospital? Um, and a lot of that was first come, first serve, which is something that I think in general we want to try and avoid. Um, you know, one of the things that we saw in the U.S. in the first come, first serve approach is that um, people that were already connected to healthcare were more likely to present to the hospital early, versus people that are less likely connected to healthcare were more likely to wait. Um, and right, there are clear racial and ethnic differences there. And so, you know, that's being seen in other parts of the world as well. Triaging, triaging oxygen, something we take for granted, antibiotics, simply accessing doctors. I talked to one of my friends who has a friend in India who's a physician. He was managing people, 1,500 patients a day through WhatsApp um, who were home with COVID and just messaging them back and forth because he didn't want to go to the hospital. He didn't want them leaving their house to go to the hospital. So how do you triage the access to doctors and access to testing? Again, I don't have answers to this, but you know, I think as we move forward, these are the areas where we really need to learn um, these are the lessons we need to learn and think about how we can apply our ethical viewpoints, our ethical frameworks, how do we adapt them to other parts of the world um, and not, you know, reproduce like colonialism and tell them this is the way to do it, but how do we give them or, or inform them of what the underpinnings that we use and then help them to develop if they want help their own ethical frameworks. Obviously you need to well, you need a well-designed healthcare infrastructure. And that's, I think, one of the biggest issues in a lot of countries is that their healthcare has received uh, very little funding um, over time. Um, and, you know, we have access issues here in the United States, too. I'm not trying to imply that we don't have our own access issues. We know how many people are uninsured. We know that um, people who self-identify as Black and Latinx were less likely to get tested early on and initially have less access to 
uh, vaccines and things like that. So, you know, we're not doing a perfect job, but when we do spend the time to invest in ethical frameworks, you know, how can we translate them into other countries that may be suffering similar, um, similar issues? The last thing I want to talk about, and this is a very, um, a very close uh, a topic for me, and um, it's the lasting impact of the pandemic and thinking towards the next pandemic. And what I want to try and convince you, it's already here. And it's not COVID-21, it's not pandemic flu. Um, the pandemic that we are living in right now that is not COVID is this. It is the effect that this pandemic has taken on healthcare workers. Now, this is a bioethics forum. We're talking about ethical issues as it relates to healthcare. There's obviously the toll that this pandemic has taken, care, taken on people that have lost their jobs, lost loved ones, kids that have been out of school, the mental illness there. So I'm not gonna talk about that, but I don't wanna ignore that. But I do wanna focus a little bit insularly right now. Um, and so I surged in the ICU um, throughout the pandemic. Um, and I, since I do a lot of research and have been supporting the state, um, uh, for the last couple of weeks, in the last couple of months, I have not been in the ICU. And when I walked into the ICU earlier this week, I'm like my heart rate went up by about, to, about 20 points. Um, and we don't have as many COVID patients. It's not as busy. Um, I'm vaccinated, but that doesn't change what we've all lived through in the past. Um, and so COVID-19 has taken a tremendous toll on healthcare workers in the setting of burnout and mental distress related to healthcare being epidemic prior to the pandemic. And I actually conducted a study at Denver Health, um, National Jewish and University of Colorado on burnout and critical care units, coincidentally before the pandemic happened. And I can tell you that it was um, epidemic then. Um, some studies have said that as, high, as many as 80% of critical care nurses before the pandemic had some symptoms of burnout. And this was a New York Times article that three out of 10 healthcare workers are considering leaving the profession. And I could tell you that this is very true. For people that are not necessarily in the clinical world, this is something that you know, we see live every day. And it's not doctors, just doctors, it's nurses, it's respiratory therapists, it's pharmacists, it's environmental service technicians, all of whom are critical to providing the team-based care that we need to save patients, whether they have COVID or whether they have sepsis or a heart attack or trauma. Um, and what we've lived through in the last 14 months is um, um, unheard of. It's tremendous. Um, I'm inspired by everybody I work with, and I'm also saddened when I when I get more emails from people I work with at CDPHE saying that they're leaving, or people that I know retiring early from the field because they just can't do it anymore. So why is this an ethical issue? I mean, yes, it's important to talk about um, um, burnout. It could be a medical grand rounds, but why is this an ethical issue? Um, so I think the pandemic that we're facing with burnout is gonna affect a lot of what we do. So there are multiple studies, burnout is unique. Healthcare burnout is one of the only things that affects all three levels of the healthcare infrastructure. It affects patient care. So healthcare staff that are burnt out are far more likely to have near misses, actual safety errors, and there have been a couple studies linking increased burnout with worse patient outcomes. So it affects patient safety. Two, burnout and mental distress, moral distress affects provider health. Nurse, physician, respiratory therapist, pharmacist, take your pick of who we're talking about. I don't want to be insular and just say doctor because I'm a doctor. It's all of us. Um, it leads to significant physical health issues and mental health issues. And it's been well established that people that have higher rates of burnout and mental health issues lead to more permanent mental health disorders like PTSD, depression, anxiety, more substance abuse, and have higher rates of suicide. And lastly, it actually affects, affects the healthcare system. So um, where in systems where providers are burnt out, they're likely to leave, and the cost of replacing a critical care nurse is on the order of fifty dollars to $100,000. Replacing a critical care physician is even more than that. Replacing a family medicine physician or an MA in a clinic, those are high costs to healthcare infrastructures that are many of whom are suffering financially already from the pandemic. But then also, and you know, I, I don't put much stock into, you know, press gainy scales and uh, patient satisfaction scores, but it does affect that. And we do know that there's our rating systems that are associated with that. Those rating systems have their own biases um, against uh, uh, minorities and women, but you know it is a metric out there. And um, burnout institutions that have higher levels of burnout have worse um, ratings. So that's one area. 
where I think burnout is going to have a lot of ethical ramifications. We're going to have see a lot of people leaving the field. We're going to have a lot of people with a lot more mental health issues calling out. Um, but then this is a really poignant article from the New York Times um, that this is um, a couple whose son has muscular dystrophy and is attached to a ventilator chronically. Um, he's been doing great. Um, but he does require um, around the clock nursing care um, for the ventilator. And they have sufficient money and insurance coverage to pay for it. The issue is, is that due to the pandemic, the, um, the aid agency does not have enough nurses to provide to the family. And as a result, the patient, the, uh, this, this young boy, sometimes goes 24 hours without a nurse. And that means the parents are having to be nurses. They are having to sleep in shifts to be able to provide the care to their son. And this is a really, uh, this, this hit home a lot to me right now. Um, just thinking about, you know, not only did people that were providing home care, um, some of them actually went into the hospital to help people provide hospital care and maybe have stayed there, or they've just decided to leave the field because um, it's become too difficult. Um, and we also see mass out of exodus in public health infrastructures. Um, and so there is a triage of care that's already happening um, for home care and other places like that. You know, we know that there's a huge backlog for primary care visits, for elective surgeries when people didn't want to come in. We have, this is completely anecdotally, but I've seen more people presenting with complicated AIDS presentations in the last year than I have um, in the preceding four years. And partly that's because people lost their continuity of care for HIV, which, um, you know, we, HIV has become a chronic disease. It's, uh, we don't really see people dying of AIDS as much as we saw in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s because of the advent of treatment. But as people lost contact with the healthcare facilities, lost jobs that provided insurance, um, you know, all of these things have been affected. And, and this fuels into burnout as well, is that as we have fewer providers, how are we going to triage the care that we provide in the future that is unrelated to COVID? Um, and you have fewer nurses in an ICU simply because people have left um, the field you know, how do you allocate resources even when we're not in a COVID surge? And when we're not in a COVID surge, people stop talking about it and they don't realize that we as healthcare providers are still living through and will continue to live through um, the, and struggle through the issues related to the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, these are just some pictures of people that, um, you know, they're stock images, but I think they really hit home about how a lot of us feel. Um, and I do think that there are a lot of ethical and moral challenges that are going to stem from burnout in ways that we haven't really talked about. Um, and that is going to be a lasting impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and in closing, what I want to say um, and encourage people to talk about, because we don't talk about this enough, is we took care of everyone else. We really have. So anybody that's a provider, anybody that's supported a provider, um, whether you're environmental services, a radiology tech, a physician, a nurse, a respiratory therapist, everybody came together to really do an amazing job. And we are emerging from the acuteness of the COVID-19 pandemic, even though some of us are still living it. But it's now that we have to make room to take care of each other and ask our hospitals to take care of us. And that is a moral and ethical imperative, I think, to invest in the mental health and well-being of our healthcare staff. Um, and um, so I'm gonna close there. Um, we have uh, about 12 minutes. Um, and I really want to leave time for questions because as I said, I am not an ethics expert. Um, I play one on TV sometimes, um, but uh, I do want to try and foster some discussion in this webinar format as best as we can, allow people to ask questions and then if people have interesting answers, uh, let them chime in. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta. Um, Julie Swainer, who's the co-chair of our ethics committee, is going to uh, monitor the chat she did and ask the questions in the chat. Julie? Okay, thank you, Dr. Mehta. Um, first, first question, two questions in this um, one comment. Um, will hard knowers change after EUA changes to approved by FDA and CDC? And it's then, a great, oh, sorry. go ahead, go ahead. Um, it, it's a great question. Um, the problem with any sort of voluntary response poll is you don't know, like if somebody gives you the reason that they don't want the vaccine because it's an EUA, well, when the EUA goes away, you don't know if they're going to change their mind. On the flip side, the people that are, you know, say they want it now, they're just waiting for the appointment. You don't know if they're actually going to show up for the appointment. So, you know, that's a problem with a voluntary poll. Um, I, you know, when, in, in doing some, some looking at the numbers, the um, hard nose translates to about 20% of the overall population, 20, 25%. 
We know that annually adult vaccination rates for flu in, um, in Colorado are somewhere about 40 to 50%. So I can imagine that a lot of the people that are hard, the people that don't get vaccinated for flu, flu, you know, there's not as much emphasis around influenza as there has been around COVID. So we'll get more people vaccinated for COVID. But I do suspect that about 20% of those or half of those people that don't get vaccinated are hard nosed. I don't know if we're going to push the, push the gambit, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Very good. Uh, many people with financial means are entering the U.S. and receiving vaccines courtesy of the people and government of the U.S. without questions. Is this ethical? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I will. So I I'm going to flip that around. Um, what? How would we prevent that? And what would be the spillover effect? Um, so would we ask people to provide proof of residency in the state or the um, or the U.S.? How would somebody who is non-domiciled or experiencing homelessness provide that? Um, how would somebody who lives in the US but is not necessarily here legally provide that information? And so I think that the, um, I, well, I think that um, we should be providing it globally. I think that people with means should not necessarily come to the front of the line. I also think about the consequences of trying to prevent that and the effect it would have on already marginalized populations and the ends of doing something like that could actually result in fewer people that are eligible for the vaccine actually having um, um, access. So while it may not be ethical, I would actually think that preventing it may actually lead to more problems. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a, a, a comment and a question about a renal dysfunction and the SOFA scores. I'm not sure the renal dysfunction score element of SOFA Charlson is biased by race so much as race is associated with a higher prevalence of renal dysfunction. In other words, blaming the scoring system may be missing the mark when it comes to disparity. If the patient of whatever race really does have more renal dysfunction, doesn't that accurately reflect a higher risk of morbidity, mortality? And shouldn't that be taken into account in resource allocation if survival truly is the bellwether of our allocation principles? So we can have um, probably multiple day conversation about uh, different scoring systems and the ethics around them and how they impact race and uh, ethnicity. Um, just briefly, the um, SOFA score utilizes something called the creatinine clearance or the GFR, which is an equation. So when we measure a creatinine, which is a blood test, that's universal, that's measured the same way regardless of um, you know, race ethnicity, but we put that into an equation that um, then gives us something called a creatinine clearance or GFR. That equation has adjustments for race um, directly, um, like transparently has adjustments for race. And there are consequences to that um, that may limit um, access to transplants for some uh, individuals of color and may also label some individuals of color as having renal disease and exclude them from other, you know, for therapies for other diseases. So what I want to highlight is, you're right, is um, on a uh, Plato level of the, um, you know, thinking back to uh, original philosophy, that the true level, the truth of renal disease, yes, that's very true. We should properly identify renal disease. But how we define what is renal disease um, is race-based. And a lot of uh, places have moved away from utilizing um, race and ethnicity in those calculations. As a pulmonologist, um, um, that affects our pulmonary function testing and eligibility for lung transplants and things like that as well. Um, also, um, you know, affects, uh, you know, what we do is we calculate a percentage. You, you have a raw number for, for some of our pulmonary function tests in liters, and then we calculate a percentage based on how tall you are, but also race and ethnicity. And it sometimes artificially lowers the score for people who self-identify as black um, or Hispanic, and they're labeled as a disease, as, as having a disease and may not be eligible for jobs like firefighters. So the way we define disease actually has a lot of racial components to it and, and can lead to a lot of inequity. And that's currently being revisited and talked about a lot. Great, thank you. Um, next comment and question has to do with visitor restrictions. Um, the policies vary by hospital and tend to lead to contentious discussions with family. And I would argue borderline coercion to get families to go comfort care because it meant they could see loved ones. 
How did CDPHE address this? I don't recall seeing guidelines. Was there any discussion about this? CDPHE didn't um, discuss this or try and mandate. Um, there were mandates about um, nursing home access, but really hospitals were allowed to define their own visitation policies based on guidance, really. Um, and um, I really struggled early on because I think you're right. I think that some of the policies were coercive, that you were only allowed to visit if somebody was comfort care or heading towards the end of life or deemed to not want further escalation of care. Um, and I think we've really backed away from that. Um, I think that, you know, early on in the pandemic, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for how even I treated patients because we didn't know what we were doing and everyone was really scared about people getting infected and coming into the hospital and trying to protect people as well. So. Um, I think that a, a visitation policies have been liberalized a lot more, um, although it's still really hard to visit an active COVID patient in the intensive care unit, but maybe that's appropriate because we know that we don't want people to be at risk um, and how vaccine status affects that. You know, people haven't gotten to that level because right now we're just trying to invest all the efforts um, into um, vaccinating as many people as possible. Okay. Um, all right. If you were practicing in Japan, what would your advice be regarding the Summer Olympics? <laughs> uh, that's a hard question. I'm not an Olympian, so I really feel bad for the people that um, um, had to requalify and aren't going to make it. Um, my two five-year-olds love watching the Olympics. Um, oddly enough, they um, love the Winter Olympics when there were three. But I don't know what the right answer is. And I think that really the local population needs to weigh. And this is where I, you know, I shouldn't be the one to make that decision. I feel like also an, um, an international organization that is not going to be, you know, right, like the head of the um, IOC, their family doesn't live in Tokyo. So, right, I feel like the local population should be able to make their decisions um, based on their level of comfort and fear. But that's my personal opinion, not any institutional opinion whatsoever. Okay. Um, some places are asking for the vaccine card. Do you know if Denver Health will change the process about this? There's already conversations. Um, so there's multiple issues in terms of accessing healthcare facilities. So right now, I still have to have my temperature taken. taken. I'm vaccinated. And we also know that a lot of infections currently um, are asymptomatic. So right, the temperature checks actually have never been proven to be helpful. So everybody's revisiting kind of the restrictions to access and how vaccine cards play into our role. Um, it may actually affect the screening process potentially. And in terms of visitor status, um, I don't think it's going to affect the number of visitors because most hospitals actually already had a two-person visitor uh, uh, maximum. Um, it was just never enforced. And so I think, well, you know, even though it's not COVID, all hospitals are really full. Um, I think that it's going to be a little while before we start opening the floodgates on visitors. And so I, I don't know how much vaccine cards are going to play a role into that because we do recognize that people have a right to refuse the vaccine. Um, um, and then we can talk about what does that mean if they want to get a job somewhere or go to university or something. Right, right. Okay, um, I, we're at time. Uh, Dr. Mehta, I want to thank you so much. I know you're in the middle of, oh, somebody asked a question here. Thoughts about booster vaccines in the future? So, th so that's, a, that's a scientific question, and um, we don't know. So both um, the head of Pfizer, um, the head of Moderna, and Dr. Fauci have suggested that they anticipate the need for a booster vaccine, but I don't know what that data is based on. And obviously, the companies have their own data. They're ongoingly analyzing trial data and stuff like that. Um, so I think the consensus from all of them is they anticipate a booster maybe a year out. Um, I want to remind people that um, uh, hepatitis B vaccination is a three-dose series. Um, MMR is three doses for kids. Um, so right, three doses is not out of the realm of what we already accept, ex expect for a lot of vaccines. Hepatitis A is two doses. Um, whether it's a booster or an annual vaccine, I don't know. Uh, we just have to wait and see. Okay, very good. Um, yeah. And with that, there are many thank yous. And I also want to thank you publicly, Anuj. Thank you very much for this update, it's been terrific. And of course, thank you for all your work you've been doing the last 16 months or so on this. Yeah. So appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks everybody everyone. to everybody out there and for everybody's support to um, uh, what we've been doing for the last 16 months. Fabulous. Bye-bye everyone. Thanks Anuj, take care.